Okay, Lewis, how do you conceive of the relationship between philosophy and science? I have no interest in the philosophy of science whatsoever. Um, what little experience I have in reading about it, which mm. is not, I've decided that there is no relationship between philosophy and science. There are really, philosophy has contributed zero to science. And my experience with philosophy in general, and, and I have come across philosophers, is mm. that they're very clever. Mm. but have absolutely nothing of interest to say. Nothing. Well, uh, I imagine a philosopher of science would ask you, as, as an empiricist, shouldn't you have read more philosophy before making a sweeping claim about it? Well, I've never seen a word... What, well, sorry, it's simpler than that. Ask, what have philosophers contributed in relation to science? And the answer is zero. I mean, if philosophers hadn't existed, science would be totally unaffected. Well, I mean, to lay my cards on the table, I feel very positively towards philosophy. And what I would Why say... Why do you feel positive towards philosophy? Well, I, th I think what's going on is that um, people have this conception that philosophers deal in the abstract and just are like questions with no answers and like talking without getting to a conclusion. Um, and I think the reason people have that impression is that um, every time that a philosopher does answer a question decisively, it moves out of philosophy, you see, so... Well, tell me an example of philosophers that made any interesting contribution to anything. Well, Isaac Newton... Was not a philosopher. He was a natural philosopher. No, he was a brilliant scientist. Well... Nothing philosophical about Newton. But he was called a natural philosopher. Well, the bank can call anybody what you like, but he wasn't a philosopher, he was a brilliant scientist. Well, I mean, I, I, could, I could name several examples. I could name David Hume is recognised no, as a philosopher. No, sorry. Hume, you, you catch me there. Okay, you like Because Hume. Hume is the one person in, regarded as a philosopher who I greatly admire. I love his stuff about do not believe in miracles and so forth. Right. And uh, right. if you ask me if there's any philosopher I respect... And I know it goes back several hundred years, but it is Hume. So Hume, I, I think Hume is terrific. Well, me too. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but but my, my point specifically about Hume was that he's often credited with being the founder of psychology as a discipline. Um, I, I don't. I, I'm not hot on psychology. But so my, my broader point is that the list goes on in terms of if you look at the foundations of every science we've got going from physics to biology to economics to psychology, there's usually philosophers around at the inception of those That's things. That's not my view of the history of science, oh, well, which well, comes from Greece, right. of course. You know, with, uh, with Thales thinking, uh, was one of the first really scientific thinkers, thinking that everything in the world was made of water in various forms. And that was the beginning uh, of philosophy. No, I beg your pardon. It wasn't the beginning of philosophy. It was the beginning of science. I um, think there's a, there's a, it's a definitional problem about what you call philosophy and what you call science because Thales appears at the beginning of philosophy textbooks as the first philosopher. Oh you know. dear, well, that philosopher is just cheating. <laughs> I think it's scientists cheating. Maybe. Oh no, it's not. If you want to call those little early things philosophy, you can cheat if you want, but... The basic origin of science was from the Greeks. Um, and, there must, and there were philosophers talking nonsense about the nature of the world all round, but they weren't scientists. And if you take Archimedes, who was a, a total genius, there's no philosophy there whatsoever. And there was no one before Archimedes who had you know, used quantitative... St you know the story of Archimedes. You know, he, what, he had to work out whether the crown was really proper gold or whether it was contaminated. Mm. And he worked out specific gravity, and that's when he shouted, Eureka. Right. I, I, I mean, he's a pure genius. You know, he was just amazing. And he worked out why boats floated and things like that. Well, that leads me to my next question, which I suppose would be, um, if you think there is a clear distinction between scientists and philosophers in any one age... Um, how would you define that distinction? What makes someone a scientist and not a philosopher? Well, those who contribute usefully to things are scientists. <laughs> the philosophers contribute absolutely nothing. Um, 
this is a bit of a, um, a, a, a tangent, but I don't suppose you've ever seen that film Zero Dark Thirty, have you? It's about the hunt for Osama bin Laden. No. Um, and that film made me really angry because... Um, uh, Good Bruce. That, that film is about one woman whose instincts about where to find bin Laden are correct <laughs> all the way through. Oh, that's nice. But uh, sh- her character is an amalgamation of, of hundreds of people who contributed to finding Osama bin Laden. Oh, I see. Um, uh, and there's a scene in the film where the kind of nervy um, generals working for Obama are like, oh, I think maybe he's probably in this place, but I'm like 60% sure, I couldn't say for sure. And she's thumping the table being like, I'm certain of this, I'm certain of this. You know, trust my instincts. That's the sort of Republican uh, motto. And That's um, not science, I have to that's say. That's not science, but uh, this reminds me of this debate because the filmmakers have retrospectively decided that she was right about everything, you know, when in fact there were hundreds of people getting things right and wrong. Okay. Um, and I, I don't think at any one time in the history of science you can say who's a scientist and who's a philosopher based on the criterion. But I don't think philosophers work on science. Um, Listen, I work in developmental biology, so hmm. there's not a single philosopher working on developmental biology, and that's the way you come from a single cell. Hmm. You know, the, it is amazing that you were once this tiny little bloody still. Yeah. And that's not philosophy, that's science. Well, it's certainly science. I'm not trying to, try to take anything but away from But what have philosophers science. ever contributed in this whole field of biology? And take, take uh, uh, Darwin with mm. evolution. That wasn't philosophy, that was science again. Well, he was putting together... Um, ideas that were similar to stuff... I mean, Hume had kind of put forward a kind of proto-version of evolutionary theory. I didn't know. Um, maybe, not really. Um, and, and Lamarck, of course. But maybe well, Lamarck, Lamarck was just wrong. Sure, but he was... Darwin's ideas didn't come from nowhere. He was part of, he no, was no, part no, of the intellectual no, no, culture. No, no, sure. Um, and I think philosophers were part of that intellectual culture. I, mean, I don't think so at all. Um, I wish I could remember Hume's particular theory, but it was a sort of proto-Darwinian thought. If you could tell me one philosopher who has contributed to biology, I'd be impressed. But as soon as I do, you'll say, oh, they're a scientist. Well, tell me who you think one is, though. Well, I've actually got um, a, a prop. Hang on. One of, one of the philosophers in Bristol said, oh, if you're interviewing Walter, why don't you give him a copy of our journal and you can, you can see what he thinks. OK, here you go. Fisher's Fundamental Theorem of Natural Selection and Philosophical Analysis. This is this guy I was just interviewing. I'm ashamed to say I don't know Fisher's theory. But if it is a thing, it doesn't seem to be philosophy. It looks like science he's discussing. I don't see anything philosophical here. Well, but this is Samir Akasha. He's in a philosophy department. Well, I mean, that doesn't mean to say anything. You, you can tell him to move my if you son, want to, but... My son is... In an engineering department, and his works as a neurologist. So wh- wh- where you work doesn't doesn't mean we give you your character. Well, this is surely um, proof of my argument that every time a philosopher does something that you think contributes, they become a scientist. Right? Yes, probably. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Then philosophers can be sensible on occasion. <laughs> <laughs> And also, the, 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 the one philosopher I'm absolutely against is, of course, Popper. Oh, no, why? Why? Oh, because he thinks that the essence of science is falsifiability, and that's just rubbish. Um, and philosophers keep on trying to define science and, and define the... I mean, of all the junk that I know, the philosophy of science is, is, is full of that. And I think the important thing to realise about science is is simply based on evidence, explanations, and internal consistency. You don't need any philosophy to explain science. There's there's, there's two things to say about that. Um, Richard Feynman says, philosophy of science is as useful to scientists as ornithology is to birds. (laughs) Good. I didn't know that. I like that, and I approve of that strongly. Okay, I thought you would, but... um, what philosophers of scientists tend to say in response is, yeah, but ornithology is really interesting. You know? <laughs> like, 
Um, if, if you said to ornithologists, you know, like, p- pack up, guys, you're not helping the birds, they would say, but we're doing this for ourselves, oh, you know, we're, we're, we're engaged in the study of, of science and yeah. the appreciation of science. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it's funny to me that, um, again, reading your books, um, you are reflecting on the nature of science, you're reflecting on the method of science, you're reflecting on the import of science for our world view. Oh, yes, I certainly um, look on the effect of science on our lives, but that's not philosophy. You regard that, you know, on the ethical issues related to science, you regard that as philosophical. Um, I certainly do, but I was also talking about the kind of metaphysical import. Like, um, you write about the way that um, science is radically counterintuitive. Yes. Um, and that we, we, that's mustn't, right. we mustn't trust our intuitions about anything. Well, it just makes it... The real point I'm making there is for non-science, it's quite difficult to understand science mm. because it goes against common sense. Mm. But So you write about these things and I would call you a philosopher of science to be cheeky I could about sue it. you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I, and I suspect that your sort of antipathy towards it is, is because you think, well, I'm doing what I'm doing and what I'm doing is scientific. It certainly um, is scientific. Um, but the, the popular books you write, um, and this isn't to discredit them in any way, but then you're not making predictions, you're not gathering evidence, no. you're, you're, you're synthesising, you're putting things together and you're... Well, I'm putting stuff together, yeah, yes. Um, uh, but, but it's not philosophy. I wrote a book, you know, for example, I wrote a book on depression. Mm. That's not philosophy. It was trying to scientifically to understand the nature of depression. OK, but I imagine that you're reading other people's literature and, and, and writing kind of a, um, almost like a review article or something like that. Yes. Um, uh, and one of the philosophers of science at Bristol said to me that what philosophers of science are trying to do um, is not just report what scientists are saying about the state of their discipline at any one moment in time, but trying to say what should be said about it trying to get the jump on the historians, really, and, and see the field in its most kind of comprehensive way. And I think you would concede that it's a valuable exercise to reflect on science and put things together. In that no, I don't, I don't see it as, as a valuable exercise at all. You, you, you can certainly look at the effect, of, the effect that science has on society, mm. but that's not philosophical. That's actually examining what effect it does. What do the public understand? Is science dangerous? You know, they're all. If you regard that as philosophical, yes, I suppose it may it mm. may well be. Mm. I mean, I've written uh, one of my main articles is is science dangerous? Mm. Would you regard that as philosophical? Not really. Um, well, I wouldn't regard it as as it's not scientific. Science. Either. It's not scientific. It's, it's reflecting on science. Yes, and so I would regard it as philosophy. Yes, I suppose. Yes, right, I suppose yeah. you can do that. All right. Here's a metaphor that I find helpful. I, I tend to think of um, philosophy as a kind of enormous sort of gravel pit where you're just kind of scrabbling around trying to get a few ideas together and you're not sure of anything and you can't rely on anything. Um, but as soon as you get a few things together and you start building a coherent body of ideas and you settle on a methodology, perhaps an empirical one, um, then you might build a tower called psychology or physics or mathematics or whatever. And uh, I think what philosophers do, they're not interested in making the towers taller, really. They're not like at the forefront trying to add new knowledge. They are consolidators. They like to inspect the foundations. They like to check the assumptions. How boring. They like to... Well, I mean, this is what you do in your books, isn't it? <laughs> but I'm certainly not a philosopher of science. Uh, <laughs> um, all right, well, I don't think I'm going to convince you. Certainly not. <laughs> um. Extraordinary. I can't even understand the titles. <laughs>